Okay, good morning, everyone. We're going to be talking about integration today. So this is a review of stuff that you have already seen before. So hopefully it should be nice and easy. Uh, a bit of a reminder. So we're moving on from our discussion of uh, partial derivatives and things related to that. And we're going to have a couple of lectures about integration, but it's not a massive component of this course. Uh, it used to be larger, but um, we decided to focus on some other things. Anyway, there's, there's a couple of things that we can do when it comes to integration in more than one dimension. And previously, you've just met it in one dimension. So today, I'm just going to go for a recap of the one-dimensional stuff to set us up for Friday's lecture, OK? There was no pre-lecture material, so you guys um, had some time up, which is good. OK, so essentially, when we're doing integration in one dimension, we're trying to work out the area under a curve, OK? So if we've got a curve like this on the right-hand side here, this is describing um, the pathogenesis of uh, measles. So here, we've got the number of virions um, number of viral particles over a given period of time. So this is days since infection. And this curve is describing how many viral particles there are in this person during the infection. And this is important because if we're trying to think about um, the infectiousness or the, the course of disease, it matters whether we are, say, day three or whether we are day 13. Okay. So we care about the different points in time. Also, we maybe just care about what's the total number of virions produced over the course of an infection. So to do that, we need to work out the area under that curve. One of the ways in which we can do that, or if we can approximate it, is by splitting it up into these different rectangles. And they could be of different widths, but usually we keep them the same width because that makes the math easier. So we split these up into rectangles and then add up the area of each of these rectangles, and we then have an approximation. And we can do this in a few different ways. So let's talk about those different ways. So when we do this, we refer to these as Riemann sums. When we have these, um, when we're splitting up uh, an integral in terms of uh, rectangles, and then we add up all those rectangles. And obviously, the number of rectangles that we have is going to affect how accurate our approximation is. Um, and we can also choose where we position our rectangles. The height of the rectangles is determined by some point on the curve. And we could do it according to a left point, a midpoint, or a right-hand point. So in these examples here, we've got the height of these rectangles is determined by the right-hand point. So in each of these cases here, it's the same curve. We're just splitting it up into more rectangles. And the heights of those rectangles are just uh, determined by where the, the right hand side. Okay, so we could have done the midpoint, which would have looked something like this. We could have done the left point, which would have looked something like this. Okay, so how you choose your points can affect um, what your Riemann sum actually ends up being. Okay, so what are we doing? Well, we're, we're wanting to integrate or understand the area under the curve between these two points, A and B. So here on the left hand side, I split it up into two rectangles. And we're going to keep the widths of these rectangles the same just because it makes the math easier. So you can think of this as being the change in x, so delta x. And this is the same in each of these cases. But when we have more rectangles, obviously, our delta x gets smaller. When it comes to doing the integral, we're essentially taking the uh, limit as that delta x tends towards zero. Okay, so we get more and more rectangles. This ends up turning towards our integral. We're not going to get quite to that yet. If we want to work out just an approximation, what is this delta x? This delta x is going to be the end point B minus the start point A divided by n, where n is the number of rectangles that we have. So that's how we work out the length of each of these, um, or the width of each of these rectangles. Okay, so those are the, the different widths. We can then think about, if we label this as x naught, we've got an x1 in the middle, and we label the point at the end as x n minus one. Perhaps that should be xn, not xn minus one. In this case, it would be x2. Likewise here, we can have this as x naught. And over here, that would be x4 and so on. And we refer to the ith one along, 
I is just you know one, two, three, four, five, and so on. We refer to that as x i, and that's the f, that's the i x coordinate. Okay. We can define x i as the i x coordinate to be our starting point plus our delta x times by i. So that's just the number of steps that we're taking. Okay, so if you think about this for x naught here on the left hand side, if we take one step from there, this is going to be a plus delta x times by one. If we take another step, we're going to have a plus delta x times by two. Okay, and so on. So we do that for every one of our slices. That gives all of our Rx coordinates. Okay, and then the height. In this case, I'm estimating by the right hand. I'm using the right hand rule here. So I'm estimating by the right hand point. Like I said, we could do it by the midpoint or by the left point, and that determines the height of our rectangles. So here, this is this height of this rectangle here is just going to be f of x1, where f is this function, this curve. And then this height here for the second rectangle is going to be f of x2. If I'd done the left point rule, then I would have done f of x0 and f of x1. That's the heights of these two rectangles. If I had done the midpoint, I would have to work out what this midpoint is here. It's going to be halfway between A and X1, and then the second one halfway between X1 and B, and work out our function value there. Okay. So we have all the ingredients we need at this point. We know how to work out the area of a rectangle, it's just the width times by the height. So we've got the width as delta X, and we've got the heights as our F of X1, X2, X3, and so on. You can think of each of these rectangles as having an area, so A1, A2, in this case, A1, A2, A3, A4, and in general, the ice slice has area A, I. So these are called right-hand Riemann sums because we are going by the right-hand side of the uh, the rectangle's height is determined by the right-hand um, coordinate. These are right-hand Riemann sums. Spell Riemann correctly. And what are they? Well, we just need to add up all these areas, right? So we have A1 plus A2 plus all the way up to A. So what are each of those ANs? Well, like I said, they're just rectangles. So we just work out the area by multiplying the width by the height. And the width is going to be fixed every time. So we're going to have delta x times by f of x1. That's going to be my area of A1. Plus delta x times by f of x2. That's the area of A2. And so on. And because there's a delta x in all of these, we can just factor that out. So we can bring it out the front. We have delta x times by the sum. Well, now we've just got our f of x1, f of x2, f of x3, and so on. So this is just the sum of our f of x i's. And that sum is going from 1 to n, however many rectangles we've got. OK, so this is my Riemann sum here my right-hand Riemann sum. We could do a left-hand Riemann sum. We could do a midpoint Riemann sum. It's the same principle. We'd be just adjusting where that f of x i occurs. Okay. So we can see, obviously, as we take more and more of these rectangles, as we increase n, that means that our delta x is going to get smaller, and we're going to have more and more accurate estimations. Okay. So that's essentially the starting point of like where we get to integrals in one dimension. And from this, we can get to something called the definite integral. Okay, so if we have a function f, so it's a one dimensional function and it's defined on some uh, region. So we've got starting at A, ending at B. 
and we define our delta x as we did above. So it's just the end point minus the start point divided by n, where n is our number of rectangles that we're having. We have our coordinate of our ith x coordinate. Again, this is just from above. We have our starting point plus how many steps we're taking, our i steps times by the width of each of those rectangles. That gives us the x i coordinate. And we just take a point x i star to be any point within that rectangle. Okay, so within that, that region. So we're breaking up our region into n different chunks of equal width. And these x i stars are just some point within the that um, window, each of those windows, okay? So within the i window. Okay, so the reason we do this is that we can write down the definite integral. So the definite integral has this, from this integration symbol here. It's a definite integral because we have these limits, a and b. So this is saying that it's a definite integral from a to b of our function f of x. And this dx here means with respect to x. This becomes more important when we've got multiple integrals because we might be integrating with respect to different variables, okay? Here we've just got one variable, but we still have to write that dx. So what is this? Well, this turns out to be the limit as n tends towards infinity, so then gets really, really big, of our sum from one to n of f of x i star times by delta x. Remember this x i star is just some point in the middle of that, that rectangle, and we're shrinking these rectangles smaller and smaller and smaller as we divide it up into more and more rectangles, okay? So this is essentially coming from our Riemann sums above. Okay, so this brings us on to the fundamental theorem of calculus then. And this states that if f is continuous, so for, for the purposes of this course, everything you meet will be continuous. Um, this is basically just saying you don't have jumps. So if you had a function f of x, it doesn't look like, say, this. That's something that's discontinuous, right? Because there's this discontinuity here. There's a very rigorous mathematical definition of continuity, but it's not relevant for this particular course, so we're not going to go into that. But it's continuous, just think of it as no, no jumps in our function. Then we said that the integral, our definite integral from A to B, is just going to be here capital F of our function B, our function, sorry, R capital F of B minus capital F of A, where B is our end point, A is our start point. And what is F? Well, F prime, so the derivative of F with respect to X is our little f, okay? So we say that F is an antiderivative. Of our little f that we're trying to find. Okay, so the reason this is important is because it means that we don't have to work out all of those different sums. Um, we only care about, for our definite integral, we only care about the end point and the beginning point. We take the difference between those two things with, our, with respect to our antiderivative, and then we get our integral. Okay, so what does this tell us overall then? So, we therefore have two different ways in which we can work out an integral. We can either do an approximation. And this is where we use a finite number of rectangles. That's just our Riemann sums, as we did on the first slide. So, you know, if you've got a curve, you don't know what the function of this curve is. Suppose it's just down on a piece of paper. You could draw lots of small rectangles, add up the sum of those, uh, some of those rectangles together, the areas of them, and then you'll get an approximation under the curve. And the more you divide it up, the better. So that's an approximation. But we can also do this exactly using the fundamental theorem of calculus, which is abbreviate to FTC. So depending on the context of what we're doing, we might want to do an approximation using these Riemann sums. 
Or if we've got the function explicitly defined, we might want to use the fundamental theorem of calculus. Okay, so this is all recap so far. So let me know if I'm going too fast on this or if you have any questions. It's a good time for questions. Nope. Okay, so that was the definite integral. The definite integral we had, I'll write them in the right order. We had these limits on our integral, right? We had this A and B, and those A and Bs are just corresponding to these A's and B's where we're, where we're working out the area under this curve, okay? The start and the end points. So we have those for our definite integral. They appear here and here. When we're doing our indefinite integral, we don't have them there. Okay, so we're not stating explicitly what our uh, limits are. How do we work out this? Well, now we have our antiderivative, our capital F, as a function of X plus some constant C. Okay, so our, again, we have F is our antiderivative and C is any constant. Okay, the reason we have, we have to add this constant in is because, if you noticed before I said we have an antiderivative, not the antiderivative, okay? There are an infinite number of antiderivatives to a function if we're doing the indefinite, uh, sorry, yeah, if we're doing the indefinite integral because we don't have these limits, okay? So for example, if we have our, um, f of x is equal to 2x, then our antiderivative is going to be x squared plus c, where c is a constant. The way to think about this is to take this function here, we take its derivative and we always get this here. So if, for example, you had f of x is equal to x squared plus 1, you would get this a little bit easier. We get f prime of x is equal to 2x, which is our little f of x. Likewise, I could pick any constant, right? If I chose x squared plus 2, again, taking the derivative, we lose the constant. So this is why we have an antiderivative, and this is why when we do it in reverse, when we integrate, we have to add this constant on here we don't know what that constant is, we lose it when we take the derivative. So when we take uh, our integral, we have to add that constant back in. Okay, so this means that we've got three different outcomes from our, uh, if we're doing different types of integration. Okay, so the first one is if we've got these numbers here, this is our definite integral with A and B just numbers. So they're real numbers. <clears throat> What does this give us? Well, if we take the integral between two limits, we're just working out the area under a curve. So this gives us a number. And this is just our antiderivative evaluated at the endpoints and take the difference between them. So that's the first possible outcome. The second is if we have, say, a variable here, x. So note here that because we've got x um, as our um, one of our limits, we've changed the symbol here. So rather than, uh, the variable, so rather than having x's here, we're having t's. It could you could use anything else. It's just so it's clear what what's going on. This is just a dummy variable because when we integrate it and then we evaluate it at um, a and x, the t's will disappear anyway. So it doesn't matter what you call it. Back. It's just a dummy. Okay, so what does this give us? If we've got a variable in our limits, this gives us a function. It's just like our definite integral above, but now we're gonna have f of x, our antiderivative, minus f of a. And then the last thing here is our indefinite integral where we have no limits, so nothing here. This doesn't give us a number or a function, 
it gives us a family of functions. By family, I mean, we have our antiderivative as a function of X plus these constants C. Now we have our family of functions. Okay. This is probably a good time to give you guys an exercise to work on to get you guys thinking about integration again. So here we've got our measles curve that we had from earlier on. That should be parthenogenesis rather than parthenogenesis. So here we've got an explicit function for this curve as a function of time. So this is days since infection. What I want you guys to do is first of all, determine the total number of cells infected. So, Interesting wording of the question here. I didn't write this question. This shouldn't really be number of cells infection, infected. This should be number of virions. Okay. So total number of virions over the course of this infection from day zero to day 21. So this is day 21 here. And we're going to do, do it by a few different methods. Okay. So first of all, I want you to have a go at um, estimating this estimating the area under this curve using the midpoint rule with three points. Then I want you to have a go at doing that using the fundamental theorem of calculus. So here we've got our function here and you want to work out the integral of f of t with respect to t, where a and b are your limits. And then finally, have a go at doing that, but working out this family of functions or rather from zero to some point t, okay? So if we have zero to t here, for this third part, t could be moving along here wherever. And we just want to have a function here so we can say, okay, after however many days of infection, how many virions have been produced? Okay, so have a go at that. Remember when we're taking, when we're working out the antiderivative of this function, our capital F, we take the derivative of that function and we get this function here, our little f. Okay, so all you're doing is doing differentiation in reverse. So if you have, for example, t squared, when we integrate that, what do we need to do? We need to increase the power by one. So we get a t cubed. Integrate this with respect to t. Yeah, but this is a little bit clearer. Integrate t squared with respect to t. Increase the power by one and divide by the new power. Okay. The reason being, if we do this in reverse, so if we had t cubed over three, when we differentiate this, the three comes to the front. And so it cancels out. And we reduce the power by one, so we get t squared. Okay. So you just need to reverse your power law when you're doing this. And don't forget your constant as well. Does anyone have any questions? I'll walk around and answer any questions you might have. Okay, have a go at that. So just to clarify in case you're not sure with the midpoint rule, the height of your three rectangles, the, mid, the middle of your rectangle, I'm just doing it here arbitrarily, okay? The middle of your rectangle needs to be the height of that curve. Okay. So that's what it would look like if I was doing the midpoint rule. If I was doing the right hand rule, my rectangle, the height of my rectangle would be determined by where the curve goes through uh, on the right hand side. And if I was doing the left hand rule, it would be like this the height would be determined by the left point. One of the reasons we do the midpoint is because it often means that. Draw it again. You've got this little bit here on the left where you're counting extra, which is bad. Um, and you're also missing out this bit here on the right, which is also bad. But these often have relatively similar sizes. So when we do the midpoint rule, these two things cancel out often. 
not perfectly, but you're adding a bit in, in a place where you shouldn't, and you're taking a bit in a, away in a place where you shouldn't either, and they kind of balance each other. That's why we often do the midpoint. Yeah. Is it possible to number and multiple Uh, Not necessarily. I would say it depends on the question. So like if it's in the exam, the exam says, give numerical answers to two decimal places, if you had a calculator, okay. then then yeah. Um, and likewise on the IQ, it will say, give your answers okay. to two decimal places. Uh, that's a good question, actually, because the biological context. Um, so, yeah, it, it depends on the interpretation of this. If you said this was an average curve over the average course of an infection, then you would say on average there could be 14.5 whatever variants, okay? But you're right. If it was a particular patient, then you would say you could round it to a number, and that would be justified, yeah. Okay, guys, let's see how you got on. Okay, so for the first part, we're using the midpoint rule. So we want three points. Our width here is, is 21. We've got 21 days. So I'm going to break this up into seven day intervals. So where's my day seven should be there. And we need day 14, so there. And we're told to use the midpoint rule. So that means I need the height at day three and a half. So somewhere around there. This gives me the height of that first rectangle and the height of the second rectangle. I'm going to need, again, this midpoint here. Should be about there. Gives me the height of my second rectangle. And then finally, about there. So this is essentially, this is my A1, this is my A2. This is my A3. My delta X is going to be seven. So we've taken 21 divided by three. Like I said, one of the, the good things about doing this is that we're missing out this area here. Or, or rather, we're adding that area here on the left, and then we're missing out this area on the right. So they kind of cancel out. Again, we miss, we add this area here, and we miss out this area. And here we miss out this area, but we add this area. So in some places you're overestimating, in some places you're underestimating. But on average, these things tend to balance out, which is why the midpoint, midpoint method is quite good. Okay, so part one, we want to know what the approximate number, this is number of cells infected, the approximate number of virions. So we need the area under the curve, and we can use our midpoint rule. If I wanted to write this out as an integral, it'd be 0 to 21 of our function f of t dt. And we're going to say that this is approximately equal to a1 plus a2 plus a3, where these are the areas of the rectangles as defined above on the previous slide. Okay, so. This, we can write out each of these areas. We had a function f. I'm going to call them x bars as the middle points. Okay, so I'm going to call this x bar one times by delta x plus f of x bar two times by delta x plus f of x bar three times by delta x. So these x bars. So I'm using the midpoint. I'm just going to define this to be x bar one, this to be x bar two, and this to be x bar three. So what do we have? Well, we've got three delta x's and those are equal to seven. So I'm just going to bring that up front. So you have seven times by our function evaluated at 3.5, 10.5, and 17.5. So those are just my X bars. We've got widths of uh, seven, going between zero and 21. So the midpoints are gonna be at 3.5, 10.5, and 17.5. If you work this out, I'm gonna trust that this is right. I have not actually worked this one out myself. 
it should have come out, I believe, 18,736-ish. Does that sound about right? Okay, good. Well, all we're both wrong. Uh, can I show a hands who got something in that, that region? Okay, great. So over the course of an infection, we're estimating that we get somewhere in the region of 18,700 virions. Ooh, low battery. Can it survive 10 minutes? We'll see. Okay, part two, we were asked to work out the total number, so the exact number, using the fundamental theorem of calculus. Can I have a show of hands who's done this? Okay, who would like more time to do this? Who doesn't care? <laughs> okay. Uh, I, will, I will go through this together. So for this part, we want the exact answer. We want to rather than approximate this integral, we want to work, out, work it out exactly. So what do we have? Our f of t, let's just copy down from above, we had minus t as by, a little bit awkward, so we have minus t, I'm going to do a copy from here, that's easier. We have minus t times by t minus 21 times by t plus 1. We can expand this out. So if I expand out the brackets first, I'm going to have minus tr on the outside still. t squared minus 20t minus 21. So that's just expanding out those two brackets. And then multiply throughout by this minus t, minus t cubed plus 20t squared plus 21t. It's just a bit easier to work with in this form here where it's expanded out. Okay, so we want to take the integral of this. So what we need to do is just substitute this into here now. Okay, so what is this integral? Just 0 to 21 minus t cubed plus 20t squared plus 21t. Integrate with respect to t. Okay, so let's do this integral. What are we going to have? Well, we can do each of these in, in sequence. So the integral of minus t cubed is going to be minus a quarter t to the power of four. Increase the power by one, divide by the new power. Exactly the same here. So we're going to have 20 t cubed over three. Here, 21t squared over 2. And we're going to evaluate this. So that vertical line just means evaluate between 0 and 21. Okay, so if we do this, we're going to have minus a quarter. Where we, we evaluate, we take the top one of all of these, we substitute t is equal to 21, and then we subtract this with uh, t is equal to 0. Okay. So you have minus a quarter times by 21 to the power of four plus 20 over three, 20 minus by 21 t cubed, yeah, not squared, plus 21 over two times by 21 squared. And then the nice thing here is that we don't have any constants to deal with. So we end up with minus zero, minus zero, minus zero, minus zero, minus zero, plus zero, not that it matters. And I believe this should come out somewhere in the region of 17,750.25. Obviously, we, we, as you mentioned, we're talking about whole numbers of virions. If this was an average infectious curve, then we would maybe care about the decimal point. I'm just going to leave those off for now. So we have somewhere 17,700. Our estimate before was 18,700. So we've overestimated with our Riemann sums. An exercise, if you wanted to do this in your own time, is to try this with either the, uh, the right-hand Riemann sums, or you could try it with more, um, split this up rather than splitting it up into three, you could say split it up into seven, and then see what you end up with and see if you get a better um, result. You should get something that's closer to this if you split it up with n equal to seven, okay? Okay, we've got seven minutes left, so I will work through. Oh no, we've still got one part of this question, haven't we? 
the final part of this question, we were asked to, again, use the fundamental theorem of calculus, and work out the total number of cells infected up until an arbitrary day t. So now we need to take our integral from zero to t, and here is where I need to use that dummy variable. I'm going to use s. I could use any letter. Because I'm integrating up to t, I don't want to have my t's in my integral here. Okay, so I'm just using a dummy variable. It doesn't matter what it is because it will drop out. We already know if we take this function here and we integrate it, we get this function here. And because I'm subtracting t when t is equal to zero, or in this case, when s is equal to zero, that just gives us these zeros on the right-hand side. So all we're going to end up with is this function from above, minus quarter of t to the four, plus 10, 20 t cubed over three, plus 21 t squared over two. We don't have a constant here because we were doing a definite integral. Okay, so the reason we don't have a constant here is because if we evaluated this first part, we had a plus C, and the second part, we'd have a minus C, and these things would just cancel. Okay, so that's why we don't have a constant here with our definite integral. Okay. Let's think up, finish up by thinking about the area between two curves. So at the moment, we've been thinking about, ignore this blue curve here, we've been thinking about the area under one curve enclosed between a curve and the axis, the x-axis. But we can look at the area between two curves. And this is important if, say, you wanted to uh, work out the area um, of a leaf, rather than just, say, working out the area of this top half and estimating that, we could almost treat these as being like two curves here. And you could use your midpoint rule to, that's a terrible approximation. You could use your midpoint rule. Let's do that a little bit better. And here your midpoints would be defined by those two curves there. Still not very good drawing. But you do this for each of these. Um, you could do these for lots of different Riemann sums. And then you could use that to approximate the area of the, the leaf of the curve. I'll leave that as an exercise. I'll post the solutions for that. I'll focus on here where we've actually got a function rather than an estimate to start with, okay? Okay, so suppose we've got two continuous functions here. We've got this f of x, the top curve, and then we've got our g of x, our bottom curve. And we're assuming that f of x over these bounds here between a and b, we're assuming that f is always greater than g. And we want to work out what is the area between these two curves. So how do we do this? Well, we've got a definite integral again with bounds a and b. And here, all we need to do is take our f of x and subtract our g of x. So it's pretty straightforward, right? What we're doing is, if you imagine this is the height of our f of x, here, if I want to work out the height all the way from the red curve to the blue curve, this height here is minus g of x. So we're just adding these two things together. So you have an f of x from the top and a minus g of x from the bottom. So that's where we get our f minus f of x minus g of x. Okay. So that gives us me the height of every single x coordinate going along here. And then we're just integrating all of, over all of those x coordinates. Okay. And that gives us the area between these two curves. So to go through an example of that, suppose we've got two curves here, y is equal to minus x, and y is equal to x squared. What do they look like? They'll look something like this. We're going to integrate between x is one and two. Do we only care about the positive part? So this is my y is x squared. And this is my y is minus x. And we want to integrate between x is 1 and x is 2. So we're just trying to find the area here. So my area is going to be the definite integral between 1 and 2. 
of my f of x, so that's the top curve, which is x squared, minus my bottom curve, which is minus x. Got a double negative here, and have the integral between one and two of x squared plus x dx. Increase the power by one, so x squared goes to x cubed. Divide by the new power, we get divide by three. Similarly, x goes to x squared divided by two. You evaluate between one and two. So first of all, we need to substitute in the endpoint. So we're going to have two cubed over three plus two squared over two minus the start point, okay? So minus x, not x, one cubed over three plus one squared over two. I'll leave that as an exercise for you guys to check if you get the right answer. You should end up with 23 over six. Not that it really matters exactly what it is here. The key thing is thinking about what the process is as to how we get to the integral, okay? That's it for today, guys. I'll see you on Friday.